Dandridge wasn't the name originally, you know. It was Francis Dean's Lower Meeting House or Henderson's Lower Meeting House. Well, that's not an appropriate name for a county seat, is it? They had to come up with a proper name. And I think this tells us something about the caliber and the type of early settlers that came here to Jefferson County. In 1793, they honored a woman to name their county seat for, Martha Dandridge Washington, the first first lady of our country from Virginia. And a lot of these early settlers came out of Virginia or spent time in Virginia. The Dandridge family was well known and well respected. And they picked a woman in 1793. Think about it. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, you know, for, there for our county. Uh, Washington's names being used. I mean, you know, when you look at the names, it's almost always the men in politics that get the, the honor in those early days. But to name for in honor of a woman, doesn't that tell us something about the type of people that settled here in Jefferson County? And it makes me very proud. So, uh, the, uh, the, 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 commi the commissioners declared this county seat. They, they named it Dandridge in honor of Martha Dandridge from uh, Washington. And as uh, far as we know, it's the only town in, in, in our country named Danbridge. So we're still Southwest Territory. The state of Tennessee didn't come along until 1796, but the little church was very active here. And the, it grew and it grew and it grew and more people came here. Uh, uh, the town is growing. At this time, basically, it's a little Western outpost on the banks of the French Broad River. That's what Danbridge is. And, and it was a very interesting place, and I'd love to go back and visit it sometime. I think it'd be very interesting. Um, but that tells you something about the politics of the area and a little bit about some of the early settlers that came here. Now, there's a monument right over here, a big stone monument. We're going to walk over there, and I want to talk about a little bit about the people that are on that monument over there. So let's walk over that way. When I had the guy here that does the dowsing and knows about the history of old cemeteries and graveyards, I asked him, what's, what's, what's going on right here? He said, oh, he did his dowsing, and what he discovered is there is an adult buried here. There is a youth, a shorter grave buried here, and there's a child buried here. And in those days, they lost so many of their children. It's, it, was kind of, it was a tough time. They had big families. A lot of times they'd have a dozen kids living in a two-room log cabin in those days. But you've got a child, a youth, and then you've got the adult here. And there's another example of it over there on the other side of the, of the stone. You'll see a small one and an adult beside it. But that's what's going on here. Um, and I mentioned the Dowser. He, he came up with three to 400 graves in this area. At that time, we put one of those, some of those survey flags, those orange survey flags, at the head of everyone, and this place was full of it, except for right back there where the church was supposed to be located. The church had grown and grown and grown, and by 1843, they'd outgrown the little log church building back here, and the church bought an acre outside of town and built a new church, and they left church land. And they started selling off their three acres of church land that Francis Dean had reserved for them, and, uh, but, you know, who owns the graveyard? He couldn't sell the graveyard, and so the graveyard remained, but it had gotten in bad disrepair. It was overgrown. Sometimes the cattle and the horses were getting in here. And so, come around over here. The Martha Dandridge Garden Club was organized in 1929, and their first project, the Garden Club, was to come back in here and reclaim the old graveyard and beautify it. And in 1930, they commissioned someone to do a study about who is buried in this graveyard here who were members of Hopewell Church and served in the American Revolution. And they came up with this list of names that you see on this marker here. Now, there's not any name on any stone in this graveyard with this name, these names on it. But the church history says they're buried here and the family's history says they're buried here. And so they, they honored these people and these are some of our early movers and shakers of Dandridge and Jefferson County history. John Blackburn was born in Virginia. He settled right on the Great Indian Warpath Trail, which is where the earliest settlement was on the Warpath Trail, because that's where the soldiers during the American Revolution, there were two armies that traveled down the, down the Great Indian Warpath Trail right through our county uh, to do battle with the Cherokee Indians, because the Cherokee had sided with the British, hoping to kick these people out. And the British said, we win, they're out of here. So. 
Blackburn had served with William Christian in 1776 and came through this area, probably staked out his claim then. Abednego Inman was from, from born, actually born in England along with his brothers Shadrach and Meshach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, isn't that neat? You know, I kind of like to think, in those days you didn't have baby name books, did you? You know, so where did you go for your names? You went to your family history, your family tree, or you went to the Bible? And you get a lot more of these biblical names carrying forward. There's a very interesting story in the Inman family history, and this was told to me firsthand by this little lady that came here. The Inmans come every year to Danridge. They're doing their genealogy and doing their research on their history, and they always wind up here, and I meet a lot of them through the years. She told me that when she was a little girl, her grandmother, who was a little girl and sat on this man's lap when her grandmother was a little girl, and this guy told her this story. These three brothers hooked up with Daniel Boone, one of the early explorers of this area, and they were down near Chattanooga, Nickajack Cave, and doing some exploring and cutting, blazing some trails, and they were sleeping overnight in the cave, and they were attacked by the Shawnee Indians. Meshach was killed in the attack. Abednego got a tomahawk to the forehead, and Meshach got a spear in the side. They were wounded but not killed. They hid out in a big hollow tree until their wounds healed enough that they could make it back here to Jefferson County. And as he told the story to the little girl sitting on his lap, she would put her hand in the scar he still had on his forehead. That is a first-hand account of a Revolutionary War soldier in the pioneer days, and it sends chills down my spine today when I think about a, a first-hand account of that. It's amazing. Samuel Lyle, he was a friend of Blackburn's. He was out of Virginia. He was the, one of the first registers of Jefferson County. The Rankin brothers were out of Pennsylvania, and they had settled on the other side of Base Mountain on the Warpath Trail, but on Dumplin' Valley. The Warpath Trail followed the creeks, and it followed Long Creek and Dumplin' Creek through the middle of Jefferson County. It was originally a buffalo trail, and then the native Indians used it for tens of thousands of years, and then the pioneers started using it. But it was the major pathway, and it's pretty much like Interstate 81 today, is what, what the Warpath Trail was. But here's something I like to point out about these guys. You've got to correct this date right here. He's 58, not 56, not 38. There were two years apart in these two guys. But if you look at the age, the average age of these guys is 75 years old. Mm. And I would dare say the average life expectancy of a man in 1800 was probably in the 40s. These were tough old guys, fighting in the American Revolution, blazing trails in the wilderness, fighting with the Indians you know, to, 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 that were being attacked on the frontier. The days before penicillin, you know, that saves a lot of people's lives. And, you know, these were, this was an amazing bunch of men. And, Sometimes I wonder if it might just have something to do with the water back here we talked about. But anyway, whoever did the research missed one. And this is my favorite stone that you can actually read in this graveyard. We're going to go over here and look at this stone now. This is a field stone engraved by hand with a date on the top of 1812, a last name, which is McQuestion, the date he died and how old he was when he died. I'm amazed we can still read this. That's his wife over there, and we can't read hers anymore. That's Catherine. But we can still read this. Doesn't even have his first name. I suspect the researcher wasn't even sure who this was at the time. That's maybe why he didn't make it. But he served with William Christian in 1776 and fought the American Revolution. And so their ancestors, Joe and Art Swan from Maryville, asked permission to put this permanent flat granite marker in here in honor of Catherine and James McQuestion because one day we're not going to be able to read this stone here, but we'll all, they'll all, their story will always be told by this new marker that they put in here. And Joe Swan comes every year and plants the flowers on these graves. And uh, we try to make sure that the people that take care of the grounds don't, don't weed eat them down. But let me tell you a little bit about James McQuestion. He has a very interesting story. James McQuestion lived on the Great Indian Warpath Trail at the headwaters of Long Creek. And he was friends with probably Jefferson County's most famous pioneer, Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett grew up in Jefferson County. Now some people say, oh no, no, the Crockett Tavern's over there in Hamlin County. 
but you got to remember until 1870 this was Jefferson County Davy Crockett got married to Polly Finley a Finley Gap who was a neighbor of McQuestion's uh, and in I believe it was 1806 that they got married here in Jefferson County and James McQuestion wound up with one of Davy Crockett's rifles now there's a couple of stories I've heard about this rifle one was that Crockett was trying to get the marriage bond and, and didn't even own a horse and had to buy a horse. Uh, uh, and he was, he was working for a Quaker by the name of Kennedy and trying to buy a horse from him. And that he sold a rifle to James to get the money to buy the horse. Now there's another story that when he was leaving East Tennessee to go to Middle Tennessee and his first two sons were born here in Jefferson County, that he came to James's general store and he had some debts to repay and gave him this rifle. But whatever the story is, that rifle is still owned by the Swans today. It's on display at the East Tennessee History Center in downtown Knoxville. And in our courthouse, we have an exact replica of it.